Hello, welcome to Star Cells and God, the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have theological, philosophical implications, as well as discoveries that point to the reality of God. Hi, my name's Jeff, and today we're going to explore the topic of nuclear fusion. But before we get into the discussion, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, Reasons to Believe, so that you can be notified of new weekly videos. Learn more at reasons.org or by following us on social media at rtb underscore official. Looking forward to our discussion today, I have Dr. Eric Hedin to join me today, and we're going to be talking about nuclear fusion. Uh, Eric, why don't you give us a little bit of background on who you are and why we're talking about this today? Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff, and I'm really glad to be a part of this uh, broadcast. Um, well, my background is uh, as a physicist. I've had a career in physics, uh, in research, and in teaching. I received my unit. Uh, degree in uh, physics from University of Washington in experimental plasma physics and um, fusion energy research. So I guess that's uh, my background that makes it appropriate for me to say something today on the topic. And um, so I also did uh, postdoctoral research in fusion energy research in Sweden at the Royal Institute of Technology for a few years. And this was in the uh, realm of what we call magnetic confinement fusion. So I'll be talking today about uh, two different uh, main types of, uh, I guess, research that are attempting to harness fusion energy for the production of electricity on Earth. And magnetic confinement fusion is one, and the other is uh, often called inertial confinement fusion using lasers. And that uh, had a recent uh, article in the news with a bit of a scientific uh, milestone that was fairly significant. Well, very good. No, I, I, I was aware of that discussion of the National Ignition Facility that had uh, achieved more energy out than they had put in, at least in terms of the lasers that were hitting its target. And so, uh, you know, I mean, nuclear fusion has been one of those things that has been in my scientific career on the map as oh this is this is a kind of the solution in some sense to our energy energy uh challenges if you will because if we can figure out how to make it work there's just an enormous amount of energy there's hydrogen all over the place and so uh kind of yeah. if you will give us a little bit of background what is it about nuclear fusion that gets so many scientists excited about its possibility for energy production well, that's uh, really what it's all about, is energy production. And um, we could almost start off by saying that fusion energy seems to be the main energy production source of the universe. Uh, pretty much every star in the universe is using fusion energy to uh, shine with. And uh, so as God has designed it, it turns out that uh, if you combine lighter elements together, into heavier elements, then there's a slight reduction in mass in the outcome, and that mass uh, is converted into energy. The amount of energy you get is uh, significant with just a small amount of mass, because according to Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, you take the small amount of mass, multiply it by the speed of light squared, which is a very large number, you get a large significant amount of energy. So um, if uh, the universe is so prolific with production of fusion energy, we might ask why is it uh, looking like a challenge? Uh, you know, fusion energy research and development has been going on for decades, uh, 60 plus years on planet Earth, and we have yet to achieve a working uh, fusion reactor. And um, so if I may, I could just maybe briefly outline what's the big challenge with building a fusion reactor on Earth? Yeah, and, that would be good. That would be a good thing. Because uh, like I said, as you said, every, fusion is just prolific throughout the universe. So yes. uh, yeah, that converting a little bit of mass into a whole lot of energy, uh, Einstein was genius, or rather Einstein was genius for discovering what God had already did in that. But uh, Yes. Why is this so challenging? Well, the the challenge is because of actually what we might say is a matter of scale. Um, every 
natural fusion reactor, namely a star, within the universe um, is extremely large compared to anything we have on Earth. Um, for example, our, our sun produces fusion energy by essentially the force of gravity being sufficient with the sun's mass to compress the core of the sun to a sufficient uh, density and uh, also thereby heating it to a sufficient temperature in order to achieve the requirements necessary for fusion energy to occur. And it takes a mass at least uh, about 10% of the sun's mass for um, a star to be able to produce fusion energy at all. Now, even something 10% of the sun's mass is still on the order of 30,000 times more massive than the entire planet Earth. So of course we can't reproduce that in the laboratory. Gravity pulls the hydrogen gas mixture of the sun together and compresses it in the core. Now we don't have a force that we can use to pull the hydrogen together on earth. So the best we can do is to try to push it together. And, and that's the challenge. Um, You've got essentially hydrogen gas, so myriads of nuclei that you want to bring together in a small space. And if you have to try to push them together, they tend to try to escape. They go sideways. They try to get away in any number of ways possible. Uh, I remember when I was in graduate school, um, there was sort of an analogy of for example, what we were doing at University of Washington, uh, it's still a major uh, scheme for development of fusion is to hold the hydrogen gas, essentially a, a hot hydrogen gas called a plasma together with magnetic fields. The magnetic field lines, um, they had this analogy, like it would be similar to attempting to hold together a, a blob of jello with rubber bands. And every time you use a rubber band and wrap it tightly around a lump of jello, it, it just cuts through the jello and the jello squirts out around the edges. And that's pretty much what you've got going with what we call magnetic confinement fusion. And well, um, well and it, you know, it, you know, just to kind of, you know, at what you're trying to do there is you've effectively got these. You know, if you want to take hydrogen and make helium, which is the fusion you're trying yeah. to do there, you've got uh, two protons, you got to th throw in at least one or two neutrons in there to get the helium. The two protons are positively charged. And so when you're, tr the closer you try and push them together, the more they want to repel each other. So that's what you're talking yes. about with the star has the gravity to pull to overcome that repulsion to get them yes. close enough. We've got to replicate that in the lab. Mm -hmm. And it's not like there's this solid substance you can push on. <laughs> I love that analogy of trying to hold jello with rubber bands. That's that's a that's a really challenging. Uh... Yeah, it gives you a mental picture of how, <laughs> how difficult. And, and and I'm glad you brought up the point that uh, the the natural barrier that has to be overcome is the repulsive charge between all of the nuclei that you're trying to fuse together. And we're starting with hydrogen, it's the easiest uh, substance to fuse. And uh, if you take essentially four hydrogen nuclei, you can fuse them together and produce one helium nucleus. But the protons, which are hydrogen nuclei, are all positively charged and they resist strongly, um, even more so as they are brought closer together. And so they don't want to get together, but they need to essentially touch before another force comes into play, the strong nuclear force, which is able to overpower the repulsive electric force and to hold them together. But the, uh, the trick is that the strong nuclear force is kind of like, um, like Velcro between two protons. Uh, you know, Velcro will stick things together pretty solidly, but you have to get them to touch before the Velcro works. You know, if you hold two Velcro strips a half an inch apart, there's no attachment at all. 
And so it is with the strong nuclear force. You can hold these two nuclei just a little distance apart, like a couple of diameters, and there's no uh, attractive force. And so they have to be brought close together and that's when their repulsive electric forces resist the most strongly. And um, so it's a challenge, but it can be done if you get the uh, protons moving fast enough. And then let's say they're in a gas and two of them are on a head-on collision course. If they're moving fast enough, their inertia uh, momentum will carry them together, overcoming that repulsive force. And, and then they'll fuse, which means they get close enough for the strong nuclear force to latch them together. And then they're stuck. They're going to stay that way. So what, what are the temperatures and pressures we're talking about? I mean, you know, the surface of the sun is kind of 5,000 degrees, 6,000 degrees. Yes. That's hot, but that doesn't seem that hard. But I, that's not the temperatures we're talking about there. Right. And uh, even within the sun, the surface temperature, like you mentioned, is you know between five and 6,000 Kelvin. But it will, if you go deep down into the core, uh, radically increase so that in the core of the sun, the temperature ramps up to around 15 million uh, Kelvin. Now, for fusion energy in the reactors on Earth, we have to attain even higher temperatures than, than that, um, maybe as much as 10 times higher, 150 million Kelvin. Or what, so why so. is that? Well, the issue is that for fusion to occur, there's actually, I would say, three parameters that need to attain sort of minimum values. And one of them is the temperature. Just to get the protons um, or the positive nuclei moving fast enough so that if they do have a head-on collision, their momentum is sufficient to carry them together to overcome that repulsive electric field force. So that's that's one thing. But then to get enough energy out, you have to have a sufficient density. And um, within the sun, you've got a very high density mm -hmm. of this plasma, which is a highly ionized version of gas where the electrons and the protons are no longer bound together in atoms, but they're kind of mixed together like a, a soup. And um, so you could say that they're each a gas, a gas of protons, a gas of electrons, and they're mingled together. They're not interacting as atoms. So that's a plasma. And in the sun, the density of the plasma is, is quite high. It's um, roughly 10 to 20 times denser than, than lead. It, it's hard to believe, but this is still in the gaseous state, but it's much denser than lead in the core of the sun. And therefore, you've got a lot of particles that are able to collide together. And then also in the sun, you've got the advantage of time. Namely, it's not a transient coming to together with those conditions of temperature and density. It, it stays that way. Mm -hmm. Whereas in our reactors on Earth, there's usually a time limit to how long we can keep things together before uh, instability set in or other factors that cause the plasma to dissipate. So we have a shorter amount of time, which means we need a higher temperature and a higher density to compensate. So, so we have to get things hot enough and dense enough for a long enough period of time. Yes. So presumably, well, what's going on there is that everything to make things hotter, to make things more dense, that's going to require energy needs to happen long enough that the amount of energy you're getting out from the fusion reaction can be enough to overcome all the energy you have to put in. You know, Star kind yes. of gets it for free because gravity is doing all the work, whereas we have to do all the work to make it happen. Yes. For either type of these uh, proposed uh, future fusion reactors on Earth, either the laser variety, the inertial confinement fusion, or the magnetic confinement variety. Uh, there's a lot of energy that is put into the reaction to, you know, as you can imagine, to uh, produce the laser beams, to produce the magnetic fields. And uh, of course, then you have to match that amount of input energy and then exceed it if you're going to have any sort of a viable reactor that uh, could be commercially available for producing electricity. 
So I know most of the history, or at least what when I've heard talk of making nuclear or fusion reactors, get these tokamaks, you know, that where you've got you know toroidal things, where you got magnetic fields trying to squeeze it, and yes. as you said, there's a whole lot of challenges of doing that. But the recent breakthrough was actually not using that sort of facility. Why don't you tell us what the breakthrough was, okay. and give us a little bit of uh, or kind of update us on what all is going on there and why it was. What what did they accomplish? Well, the, the breakthrough that I think was December 5th, uh, when it was announced, um, so just, just very recently, occurred with the inertial confinement fusion uh, experimental facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And the idea there was they were using extremely powerful lasers. And that facility has the most powerful laser um, facility in the world and it is designed to focus actually 192 um, ultraviolet laser beams onto a very small target. And the target actually contains a, a small pellet of fusionable fuel. And we might just talk for a minute about what is the fuel. Um, it's essentially a mixture of deuterium and tritium which are names given to two different isotopes of hydrogen. Hydrogen is um, the most common element in the universe. And it is just one proton in the nucleus for normal hydrogen. Deuterium has one neutron attached to that proton. It's an isotope that's naturally occurring. Uh, it, it's in a certain fraction of all the hydrogen in water. So we drink deuterium every day <laughs> and it's, it's chemically very similar. So it doesn't uh, you know, have any ill effects. But then the other isotope is tritium and that has a total of three nucleons, two neutrons attached to the one proton. It's still hydrogen, but it is a, uh, a rare isotope in that it is also um, radioactive, it has a, a half-life of only about 12.3 years, and uh, then it decays. Then that means that it's in very limited quantities, naturally. Uh, it pretty much needs to be produced. Mm -hmm. Now, this produces so, some... So, so, so yeah. we're using, uh, by using the deuterium and the tritium, we're making the fusion process a little bit easier because instead mm -hmm. of having to get four protons together now, two of which have to convert to neutrons, we're effectively converting to the neutron or using protons that have been converted to neutrons and only having two uh, protons that now need to get close together, which presumably makes the process a lot easier. Yes, it is easier. It uh, has a lower sort of a threshold of energy barrier to get over in order to produce an output of energy. Um, so it's kind of the starting point for mm -hmm fusion reactors is this combination of deuterium and tritium. You know, maybe future uh, versions of fusion reactors might be able to use just uh, pure uh, deuterium gas, and you can fuse that as well into helium. It just takes a little higher threshold of energy. And uh, the plus side, though, is that deuterium is naturally abundant mm -hmm. and in pretty much unlimited quantities. And Back to really the first question you ask, why are scientists excited about fusion energy? That's one of the answers is that uh, once we uh, master the technology, the fuel for fusion reactors is virtually unlimited. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one advantage. The other advantage that we could talk more about later perhaps is that the reaction itself is not something that is going to produce radioactive waste. Mm. And so you don't have the kind of downside of a nuclear reactor, such as with fission. Right. Well, and, and you also, you know, I know a lot of people have talked about this kind of lately in terms of the climate change. It doesn't also have carbon dioxide or water as an output. You're really just taking hydrogen and making helium. And so there do, there do seem to be a lot of benefits there. Um, yeah. Kind of continue to finish talking about what okay. is the, you know, you talk, we've talked a little bit about the magnetic confinement, but what's the, 
what did the national or you kind of finished your description okay. of the national sure. engagement facility and what they what they were able to accomplish? Right. So you take this um, facility that is able to produce these high power laser beams, and it's a lot of technology to get the laser beams to focus on a tiny pellet of fuel. Um, I mean, the the fuel pellet size, I heard it described as about the size of a, of a small peppercorn. So, you know, just small, and it's housed within a container about um, the diameter of a dime. It's a small cylinder about that uh, diameter and just maybe a centimeter long or so. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a two-step process, maybe three steps. The laser beams are uh, focused together uh, through a portal in this little cylinder and they blast the inner surface of this cylindrical container. And that then heats up the inner surface and produces a, an abundance of x-rays. And mm -hmm. the x-rays then um, are what irradiates the fuel pellet and heats up the outer surface of the fuel pellet, which is inside the little cylindrical container. And the fuel pellet um, outer surface gets um, seriously heated by the x-rays and it ablates off, you know, it's basically being burned off. And as it ablates off with a lot of energy, there's um, kind of a Newton's third law reaction, which drives the inner contents of the fuel pellet inward, compressing it very highly and heating it at the same time. And that's what achieves the conditions for fusion, is this compression and heating of the fuel pellet by the x-rays, which are produced by the laser beams that hit the inner surface of the uh, container, the small cylinder called a whole rom. So it's a complicated process. Um, and it has taken scientists years to come up with what seems to at least work partially. You know, even the lasers, and it was, I remember some years ago, they realized that the whole heating process would be more efficient if they used um, shorter wavelength lasers into the ultraviolet frequencies than, than visible light lasers. And so there have been many iterations of um, research that have tried to improve the process over the years. So what's the time scale? Uh, you know, you've got this little pellet blasting this enormous amount of energy things are heating up and blowing apart and compressing what's the time scale on you know because you were saying you need to have the temperature the density for a sufficient amount of time what's the time scale on all that happening inside these pellets well for this inertial confinement fusion where the lasers it's it's a pulsed system so so it's a very short time scale where the lasers um in a single pulse, irradiate the target, and that, uh, if it works properly, is heated and um, achieves nuclear fusion conditions, and it, it essentially explodes. And so it's it's like a a, a small firecracker <laughs> going right. off, you might say, and um, you know maybe maybe small firecrackers, you know, not the right scale, but in the sense of it being instantaneous almost in like that. There's a small explosion. It's not a sustained uh, long-term steady state reaction. It's it's a pop. And it, it then during that explosion of the fuel pellet, there is actually fusion taking place. So it the intense heat and the density cause a nuclear reaction. So it's no longer just a chemical reaction. It's it's a nuclear reaction where the deuterium and tritium nuclei fuse together and produce a new element, nucleosynthesis of helium. And the helium is the, is the byproduct. And it also has the advantage that every helium nucleus that is produced contributes to the heating of the remainder of the fuel. So that's when you get a self-sustaining nuclear fusion reaction when the, the 
products of fusion then contribute to producing further fusion and heating and so on. And that's called ignition. And so at the Lawrence Livermore Lab laser facility, they achieved for a very short time ignition. And that's why they were able to uh, report um, getting out about 50% more energy from the shot, if you will, than what went into it. Yeah, my, I remember reading the numbers and I, they can calculate the amount of energy from the lasers that is impacting onto the holoram. And I think it was, you know, something on the order of two megajoules. Yes. And given the amount of fuel in there, they, they can uh, calculate and measure that they got about three, little over three megajoules mm -hmm. out. So it seems like yeah. they've done it, that they've, or you put in two megajoules, you get out three megajoules. That, that's a win. That, that's really the breakthrough. Yeah. That's a pretty remarkable accomplishment that they've been able to do that. Yes, it really is. And so what's left to do, I mean, there's a lot of work. If you go to the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab website and look up about uh, the inertial confinement fusion research, you'll, you'll see that um, you know, they're, they're not uh, making any false claims about a, a fusion reactor coming online in the next two years. You know, it's, uh, it's a long process still to making this commercially viable. And one of the things is they have to be able to um, design the facility so that it can repeat that pop very rapidly on the order of 10 times per second. They need to um, have the lasers focus on a fuel pellet, have the mini explosion, gather that energy, clear it out, replace it with a new fuel pellet and do it again 10 times per second and then to keep it going. And so there's a lot of uh, mechanism that needs to be in place before that can happen. And, so um, what, what is it that determines the 10 times a second there? I, well, I guess my question is, okay, so they've got this one brief moment of time where they've got this pellet, they irradiate it with the lasers, it generates more energy from the, la or given the amount of laser energy that is shown towards the pellet, it generates more energy than that. What are the remaining things? Obviously, you want to be able to do this continuously, mm -hmm. but I'm also aware that you have to generate all the energy for the lasers, you have to make the, I mean, there's a lot of other things that go into a system where the amount of energy you're getting out actually exceeds the in, the amount of energy you're putting in from everywhere, which is kind of what the, the promise of fusion was, that it's got more energy coming out than what's going in. Well, one of the things we haven't even talked about yet is that it's not just getting energy out, which in the, uh, in the recent uh, uh, experimental result that uh, was touted as a, a, you know, a milestone of ignition, um, it was just energy released in the form of, of heat, essentially, uh, you know, high energy radiation and so on. But the goal is to make electricity. And so that involves a whole other step in the reactor design. You have to be able to um, gather that energy from these mini fusion explosions and to then bring it into a, a normal kind of a, a electrical generation process uh, through uh, heating up uh, an intermediary material that could be used to drive a turbine that could then turn and, you know, in the normal way, generate electricity. Um, so, so none of that is built into the, uh, the Lawrence Livermore uh, facility at this point. And you know, right. that's, that's down the road. Um, and then, of course, you know, once you have that uh, you have to be able to keep it going in a sustained manner. Gotcha. Yes, I, I that did. Even in my list of things that I could see as problems, there you go. One, you've got, uh, you know, just energy. You got to make all the energy for the lasers, and I think they said the lasers, the the power required to drive the lasers. Though there was two megajoules that was shining on the the hologram, I think it was something on the order of three hundred joule, three hundred megajoules. So 300 times that amount or 150 times that amount to power the lasers themselves. So we're putting a lot of energy in this to get a lot of energy out. But even that energy that's coming out isn't usable yet. Uh, so there's 
yes. some amount of that that's going to be lost in making it usable energy, if you will, it sounds like. Right, right. At, at every step in an energy transfer system, you know, essentially um, a power plant, uh, there are losses that, uh, you know, bring down the efficiency. So, so that's probably part of one of the reasons why uh, there would need to be a repetition rate of at least 10 reactions per second, just in order to help overcome uh, those unavoidable losses in the energy production process. So I, I kind of threw you a little bit of a curveball here. I don't know whether you've thought about this, but as uh, you know, I was having a discussion with my dad the other day because uh, we want to move towards electric vehicles. And I think, you know, electric vehicles are cool. Okay. Great. I, I have no duck in the duck in the pond as to whether electric vehicles are good or bad, but they're often touted as this is a way to get to combat global warming or climate change, if you will. Hmm. And I have no doubt that electric vehicles in California, particularly large cities, will reduce emissions, make air cleaner and all that sort of stuff. But when you're talking about climate change, you now have to not just worry just about the vehicle, but it's all of the stuff that goes into building that. And so this 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 has the same sort of flavor of question of generating energy from nuclear fusion. Yes, we've got ignition. Great. I, again, phenomenal accomplishment. I don't want to take anything away from that. But there seems like there's a lot of steps or uh, there's a lot of factors that you have to take into account if you want to say, hey, this is a better way to produce energy than fossil fuels, if you will. And so mm -hmm. I guess I'm just kind of curious, what? How, how do you look at questions like that and make sure that you see what's really being accomplished without getting drawn into the hype of what could be, if you will. Does that question make sense? Well, when you say drawn into the hype of what could be, I'm not sure entirely what you were referring to. You mean oh, in so terms you've got of nuclear fusion? Well, okay, we got nuclear fusion. Oh, we're about ready to make energy, and you know we're we're getting out fifty percent more energy than we put in. Mm -hmm. That's 50% more energy in a very specific way of measuring, not in the, ooh, nuclear fusion is going to provide more power than we put into it type measure. So it's a phenomenal accomplishment, but in the bigger picture, there's a whole lot more uh, stuff that goes into that. How can we help people realize the, to put things in the proper context, I guess? Well, it, maybe I can just start with what you brought up earlier about um, electric vehicles and, and their promised, uh, I guess, uh, reduction in emissions and you know, greenhouse gases and global warming uh, threat and that sort of a thing. And you know, one thing to keep in mind is every electric vehicle has to be charged and so it needs electricity. And that electricity has to be produced somewhere and uh, still most of our electricity in this country is produced by burning fossil fuels. So if you're not burning fossil fuels directly in your car, such as with a gasoline engine, um, you're burning fossil fuels somewhere else to produce electricity to drive your Tesla or, or whatever variety of uh, electric vehicle you may have. And um, so it's it's partially a displacement <laughs> scene in that um, you're displacing the the burning of fossil fuels from the place you're driving your car to some centralized location of a of a power plant somewhere. You know that can be good because power plants typically are out away from population centers, mm -hmm. so that can reduce the uh, kind of a smog problem within cities. And I think that's a good idea. Um, now, back to fusion power plants, they would be a, in the future, if they come online as commercially feasible power plants to produce electricity, they would be a clean source of electricity that could then provide the electrical energy necessary for say, um, many people using electric vehicles. And there would not be greenhouse gases emitted in either location, either where the vehicle is being driven or where the electricity to drive the vehicle is being produced. Because nuclear fusion power plants would not produce any greenhouse gases. 
And the other thing about them is that they basically don't produce radioactive waste. And so uh, they're much safer than a, a fission power plant. A fission is where you take uranium and break it apart and get nuclear energy in that uh, process. It's basically the opposite process. Right. And um, yet it produces a large amount of radioactive waste. And also they have uh, the potential of disastrous failure modes where there can be a meltdown and uh, an explosion and a release of radioactive waste. And these things have happened in the past. Um, a fusion power plant, it's, none of that is even possible. Uh, they, they can't explode. Um, they don't have enough energy density for that. And there is no radioactive waste. I mean, the main byproduct of a fusion power plant is, is helium. It's the same helium gas that uh, you would buy at a grocery store to put in a set of birthday balloons. Right. Um, now, now the, the reactor vessel itself will become radioactively hot as it's being run, uh, which just means that um, that produces extra challenge for the engineers who are designing it, that they have to be able to uh, build remote control um, maintenance, um, kind of robotics, basically, to service the machine because you can't send in technicians to you know, replace the light bulb, so to speak. And um, that's one of the challenges with the uh, the magnetic confinement fusion reactor that's being built as a test model in uh, Europe, known as the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER is the initial for that, ITER. And um, it's not just building a large reactor vessel that can produce magnetic confinement fusion, but it's also ha having to engineer um, robotic maintenance uh, capabilities for when they uh, introduce deuterium and tritium, it, it will produce uh, um, enough radiation in the reaction that will radiate the, the structural elements of the reactor itself, and uh, they will become too hot to handle, so to speak, mm -hmm. in terms of radiation. But there's no like buildup of slag and waste and radioactive material that you've got to figure out what to do and how to store it for thousands of years. That that's just not a byproduct of a fusion reactor. So that's a good thing, right? Well, and and just the the fuel itself doesn't have nearly the radioactivity that uh, a nuclear fission uh, plant does as well. So yeah, I, I, there, there's a lot of things that are a benefit there. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, one of the things just in our discussion here that I realized is that there are a few places where God, it seems like God has put into our universe red, or good energy sources, uh, you know, nuclear yeah. or fossil fuels are a great source of energy. They have mm -hmm. basically stored energy from the sun over, you know, many thousand, millions of years concentrated yeah. so that we can relatively simply extract that energy and use it for our purposes and do do good things with it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's nuclear fission where there are these elements that uh, are relatively easy to break apart and to get the energy out. Now a little, you know, you have the problem there of you got nuclear waste or you know, radioactive waste. You've mm -hmm. got uh, nuclear fission, which seems even harder to make work, but has even more benefits to it. It, it almost seems yeah. like God has structured things so that there are easy to use energy sources that allow us to work through the process of getting to the harder to use radio sources. Mm -hmm. Do you, it, it just seems like God's put things in place so that we can enjoy the benefits of the energy while we're solving some of the problems that come with each forms of it, if you will. Yes. I believe that's a good kind of a analysis of the situation. I, I would agree with that, that um, God has uh, designed Planet Earth, like you mentioned, fossil fuels, so that they're readily available, um, kind of as a, a first stage of uh, energy use for modern technology, modern society. And then there are these nuclear uh, versions of energy production that, um, you know, it takes a little greater uh, level of uh, 
sophistication of technology and effort, but um, the payoff is maybe higher and the resources are more abundant and that could um, kind of take us through uh, the next era. And, you know, I don't know how long um, humans on earth will, will be around before the Lord returns, but um, you mentioned your dad and I remember a conversation with my dad when I was in graduate school and studying fusion energy and you know he's not a a scientist but a businessman and um he just kind of thought about it and said you know i just wonder if uh nuclear fusion is maybe god's plan for providing energy for the millennium hmm. and uh i thought well that's interesting you know it's always kind of been in the back of my mind and uh who knows but uh i do find that there's a, an amount of fine tuning and uh, for example, in my book, um, Canceled Science, I, I talk about fusion energy production within stars. And uh, it's interesting that it only works because of quantum mechanics. We haven't even talked about that, but to get these protons close enough together to fuse, you know, if they actually have to touch, so the strong nuclear force could uh, bind them or fuse them together, the conditions would have to be much more extreme than are reached within our sun, let's say. Mm -hmm. But because of quantum mechanics, the wave function of the protons extends out to uh, a larger distance from the particle than, it, than it's a kind of a classical radius. And so it's easier through essentially quantum mechanical tunneling for the particles diffuse together than if we didn't have the quantum mechanical uh, processes in play. So again, there's just a lot of, um, I think, design that has been built into the system, even in the very fundamental aspects of uh, the laws of physics from the beginning of the universe that God has made it so that it actually works. And right. That, that, you know, that's a fascinating concept because, you know, it, lacking the the scientific knowledge we look and and we live in a classical world i mean that's just fundamentally that's the way things are in the way we perceive things but i you know our investigations have realized no the the fundament the foundations are actually a quantum mechanical world mm. and yes. i i lose some of the things that i like there's this definiteness to where things are and how they move and what they can do but yeah, just in your description there, were it not for quantum mechanics, fusion wouldn't work as well, which mm -hmm. means that suns don't or stars don't work as well. And right. our, it just changes everything pretty dramatically. Yes. And I, you know, I just kind of, it reminds me of my studies in Christianity where I'm limited to space and time. I perceive things a certain way. And the more I know about God, it's like, oh, that's so much bigger, so much yeah. more mind-blowing if you will than what i thought I, I just had that same sort of recognition mm -hmm. here thinking about quantum mechanics and fusion so i, I appreciate that yeah. you know something else that i think can be instructive is uh you know if any one of our listeners um would just go online and look up for example the magnetic confinement fusion device known as uh, iter that's being built in europe it's a it's been undergoing a construction process for years and it is huge and it's an immensely complicated process with actually over a million components that have to be assembled in the correct order in order to achieve the outcome of what they're designing this facility to do and i thought okay think about how complicated that is now you know Think about a cell. And since this broadcast is called Stars, Cells, and God, you know, we'll bring the cells into it. And imagine that constructing a cell is much more exacting, much more uh, component uh, intensive, uh, design intensive than the nuclear fusion reactor being built in Europe. And to imagine that that reactor could just be built by whatever random process is absurd. And uh, I think likewise, we can see that something even more complicated, like a living cell, for that to be uh, put together without design is just not going to happen in this universe. 
Well, and, and and on top of that, those cells work far more robustly than those things that we've put together. Yeah. Today. <laughs> yes, that's Smart right. They do so I, much more. I appreciate one one final question here. Um, you know, the National Ignition Facility getting more energy out from the laser energy they put in. Again, phenomenal accomplishment. What do you see as the time scale for maybe having a viable nuclear fusion reactor that produces usable electricity? Well, I I would hope that it could happen within my lifetime. <laughs> um, back when I was in grad school, we used to kind of hear it said that um, the time scale for uh, development of fusion energy is always 30 years in the future. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, it it may be that still today. Um, I was just reading about the uh, magnetic confinement version, and they were saying that they hope to have a, a demonstration reactor online that would have uh, not just a temporary ignition of plasma, but a long-term stability and so on. Uh, they have hope to have that going in the 2040s. So, you know, maybe 20, 25 years from now. And then to the next step would be production of commercially available reactors. Um, so it might be 30 years from now. But I think that it's actually a little more of a realistic timeline than when I was in grad school, you know. Right. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully within within our lifespans, uh, we will see fusion energy come online to produce our electricity. Oh, very good, Eric. I thank you. I appreciate, uh, you know, I just wanted to mention that Eric is one of the members of our scholar community. I encourage you, if you've got interest in science, faith, apologetic issues, and what Reasons to Believe does, go check out our scholar community at reasons.org. And again, thank you for joining us today uh, on Star yeah, Cells and God. Man want to encourage you to join the discussion in the comments below. Remember to like this video, to subscribe for more content. New episodes release each Thursday here, YouTube, and on your favorite podcast app. Uh, make sure to get a reminder so that you know when these videos come out. And just remember to share this video with a friend. And always remember that the more we know about science, the more we have reasons to believe.